good afternoon to a very rainy day here in the Sabi sand of South Africa and welcome to all of you joining us for the Nat Geo Kids Show. My name is Taylor and on camera with me today is David. Now if you would like to ask us any questions you have to ask your parents to help you and what you can do is you can get them to send us an email to natgeokids at wildearth.tv and then that way they'll be able to ask us questions how exciting so in the very very far distance we're hoping to get a little bit closer are some elephants and they've been very naughty elephants for the entire afternoon because they've been trumpeting and making lots and lots of noise so i don't know what scared them or or if there's maybe an a, a elephant bull, so a, a boy elephant that's causing some trouble with this family of elephants, but they've been telling us from very far away that they're not happy, happy at all today. But our plan is to go a little bit closer, and there is actually a road. You can ju just see the road there, that white line, just below or in between the green trees and the dark brown tall trees, the Maruda trees at the back. So we're gonna aim to get to that road, and then hopefully, once we're there, be able to see the elephants a little bit better let's carry on let's go around but we have to go the scenic way around because i can't go over the damn wall just yet there's still some guests in the lodge so we'll take the scenic way around who knows what else we could find in between right off you go off to james we have to call him uncle james on the safari and he's looking for a leopard Don't you dare call me Uncle James. Good afternoon. Hello, kids. Lovely to have you with us on this well blustery and rainy Sunday afternoon. Su Saturday afternoon. It's not Sunday just yet. That's tomorrow. Please talk to us using the email address natgeokids at wildearth.tv. You can ask your parents to send through any questions you might have. And you've just seen my name is James, not Uncle James, thankfully. Senzo Mkize is on camera. He is having a small snack at the moment and filming. That is how brilliant he is. We are going to do our best to find you a cat, I hope, today. There was a leopard just around here this morning. And we'll see if we can't find him in the car. Somebody found him on foot. A very brave person came out here on foot. That was Brent. And Brent found him on foot earlier today. Somewhere around this area. Not sure exactly where, and it might be a little bit too difficult to get in there in the vehicle, but we will try. Oh, Senzo actually knows where he is. You know where he is, do you? Do you think we'll see him in the car? Senzo says he has good hopes that we'll see him in the vehicle. So let's pop our heads down here. You can see some vehicle tracks from this morning down here. Now, this young leopard killed a nyala, which is an antelope. We'll try our best not to show you anything gory, but it would be nice to see the cat. And you see him. Senzo, who has got better eyes than anybody in the whole world, has just spotted the leopard. So we'll just have a very wide shot of him there. He's, he's, he's sitting in the tree. Look at that. That is one of our very favorite male leopards. We won't show you too close up, of course, because, well, it's a bit disgusting seeing all that meat. So we'll just watch it there. And what he's doing is eating a nyala, which is an antelope that he killed here at some stage, probably in the last two days or so. Isn't that special? Now, this special cat's name is Hosana, as many of you know, I suspect. And this magnificent cat is just over two years old. In fact, he's about two and a half now. In fact, he's going to be three in February. So I'm going to sit here with this cat. But one of the greatest spectacles on planet Earth is the one that Stivovo is now going to show you all the way up in East Africa. Good afternoon, boys and girls. Welcome to the Mara Triangle up in Kenya. And the plains abound with zebra and wildebeest. And in the background, we have got an enormous storm. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Falkenbridge. I'm joined on camera by Archie. And we are trying to avoid the rain. Unfortunately, it has been quite difficult so far. But we are doing our best. We're going to see, though, if we can find for you some lions. Wouldn't that be nice? But if we just go back onto the plains here, there are thousands and thousands of animals. But look at the storm. There is an enormous storm 
enormous storm that has come in from the north and moving across the mountain range in the distance there and you, I don't know if you can hear the lightning and thunder it's quite dangerous actually to go towards the storm because we're in a vehicle that's got a very long metal pole on the back and so if we did go in there and lightning struck out the metal pole well we would probably kill all of our equipment blue incredible cloud isn't it yes what a cloud indeed and these two storms are actually moving towards each other and we've kind of picked a path to go between the middle but we're not sure if we're going to go through there now but for the meantime we are in the Masai Mara triangle where there are thousands of wildebeest in the major spectacle as James said of the migration where the wildebeest come in numbers of about they reckon 1.3 million and the zebra about 600,000 make the journey south from from the south in Tanzania and they come all the way up here to feed on the very delicious green grass that we have you can see lots of them all the way to the horizon with their heads down they are enjoying the fact that it's raining because what the rain does is the rain makes the grass go even greener so they're getting nice and bulky lots of energy eating all of the green green grass and then after they've eaten it all then they generally move all the way back down to to the Serengeti in Tanzania where they will have their babies in a number of months but this is an incredible spectacle that we are able to show you but in the meantime my very good friend James Henry back down in South Africa would like to show you a spotted hyena now that is a spotted hyena and one of the greatest hunters of course of all those wildebeest there in the Masai Mara and the spotted hyena not this particular one of course he's never been up to East Africa because it is about two and a half thousand miles away from where we are now and hyenas can't run that far they can run far but not quite that far this particular one is waiting for Hosanna to drop a piece of meat out of the tree that he is sitting in and he's very very patient He's probably been here all day long, waiting to see if a small scrap won't fall down. A little bit like, I suppose, a dog that might wait at your kitchen table, waiting to see if you don't drop something down. And I suspect that that hyena will be there all night long. And you can see, not a thin hyena, so obviously the strategy of waiting for scraps is clearly works for this hyena. And interestingly, we know who this hyena is. This hyena's name is Corky. And Corky is part of the Juma clan of hyenas. And we think she's just had, in fact, we know she's just had some babies. And I don't think they've been seen for too long or for a little while now. And maybe she'll lead us back to her den. And interestingly, hyenas like this, who've got little babies, will very seldom take food back to the den. They will normally eat in situ, as it were, and then go back to the den. But Hawkey is quite senior, we think, in the hierarchy of the Juma clan of hyenas. And so, because she's quite senior, she might take some food back to her den site and allow her babies to eat actual meat. They'll start eating meat very soon. Interestingly, hyenas are born with teeth, which is very unusual for mammals. Most mammals are born without teeth, like you were. Ooh, Cal, you say we saw the cub this morning. That's wonderful news. So Corky's cub is fine. I'm not sure if she had two to start with. I think it was probably just the one. She may have had two, though. Often they don't both survive. But you can see old Corky here is definitely very well fed. And she can never eat enough, of course, because she's feeding a youngster. And she lovely? I'm going to stay here, see what Corky does. Maybe she'll go looking for her cub. Maybe she'll just wait here for some meat. <laughs> Hello again everybody. 
I was trying to find my friend for you, but I'll show you my friend a little bit later. He fell out of my hood. See, I've been, like I said to you, we're trying to get to those elephants again, but there's been so many elephants around, lots of them. So I'm trying to see if we can't find another herd that's maybe closer. And we also want to try and hide away from the rain because it's not very nice. So if we can find some animals that we can sit and watch, that will be the best. But we'll try our best too. There's just tracks everywhere. But with all the rain that has now fallen on the footprints, I'm not really even going to be able to show you a footprint nicely. But they've got big feet, as you can imagine. Very, very, very big feet. Maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe we'll even see some cool eagles and things because they won't be flying around in this weather. They'll all be sitting on branches. So I'll keep my eyes out on all these branches. Maybe some trees with a little bit of leaves on them. That'll keep them nice and sheltered. Or what else could we see? I saw lots of giraffe on this morning safari. So we might see the giraffe again. And I was actually, and buffalo. David and I were with a big herd of buffalo. We were surrounded by them. So... If we don't find anything here, we'll go all the way to the south. So that's down that side that you can't see. And uh, and then we'll see if they came back. They went and they drank in a watering hole. And then they came back again. So I think we should have a good chance at finding them. But I do want to show you my most favorite animal in the whole wide world. And spend a bit of time with them. Which is the elephant. But it's not looking so promising right now, unfortunately. But we'll keep on keeping on. Okay, what else are we going to look at? I can't even tell you about too many of the plants because half of them don't have leaves on them anymore. Well, they're starting to get leaves now. We'll see. Oh, I just got a free drop of water in my mouth. No need to, to have to hydrate out my bottle today. I can just do that. <laughs> okay. What? Look at that. I'll show you something quickly. Actually, we can look what's on the middle of the road. So there's some branches that are just over, just in the middle of the road, and they've got lots of thorns on them. But can you see that bright yellow part? So I know that the elephants have been here. So at this time of the year, so we're in spring at the moment, but we haven't really had any rain. This is the first day it's really rain. Well, it's not even even raining. It's just drizzling at the moment. So there's no grass for them to eat or nothing that's green. So they've been eating the bark. And that more importantly, they've been eating the cambium layer. Now, that's a big word. It's not too important for most of you just yet. But it's basically the layer where all the nutrients come from the roots and they travel through the bark and then up to the leaves so that the leaves can grow nicely. But the elephants love to eat that layer. Some moisture in there and lots and lots of nutrients. So that's what's happened. So that's a good clue to try and find the elephants so we shouldn't be too far away. But I'm going to send you all the way to Kenya now to the Mara with Steve. And uh, it seems like he's got some really, really, really small antelope called Topi. Well, you are back up in the Mara. And, uh, well, I think we are behind the rain now, which is awesome. Have a look at that little youngster. That's a baby Topi. And it is very wet because the rains have passed through here already. And look at it. It's very fast. Yeah, it's going to go to mum. Where's mum? Mum looks very similar to the wildebeest, but um, the colour is a lot, a lot sort of more reddish brown in color you'll see there's another baby and there's mum or one of the mums anyway and the topi are also one of the common animals you find around but with all of the wildebeest around they really do disappear into the landscape and um, the topi are hoping that the predators don't find their babies because well the babies need to hide in the long grass so as to avoid the predators finding them and they can run very quickly look at that only about a week old and look how quick it can run and two of them and they do blend into the ground and the grass quite nicely this time of year but look as Archie pans across here just have a look at how many wildebeest there are in the plains it's just going to keep going Marla you say cute it is too precious in fact all the way to the back of the screen there is where Tanzania is the Serengeti and look just watch for a moment all the way to the back there's just wildebeest everywhere it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and they like short grass all around here and the grass is being chopped nice and short by the zebra and then the wildebeest are able to feed on it they like to eat grass and you see how long their neck is to help them 
reach quite down, quite nice and low. All across the back of the mountain, there's one zebra hiding in amongst them. There are lots of zebra here as well, but they don't seem to be in the same sort of numbers as the wildebeest, although there are still so many. Look, the whole mountain is full of wildebeest, and people come all away, all the way across the world to see these animals in their enormous numbers. And everywhere we look at the moment is just wildebeest. So in and amongst them, all over the place, we going to, there are some lions and hyena, as well as leopards hiding in the valleys, and cheetah as well from time to time. Chihuahua, you want to know if topis have one or two babies at a time, and as far as I'm aware, only one, but twins are, they do happen from time to time with certain herbivore animals, but that I think was just a youngster following another youngster. But it's not uncommon to have twins, but it's just a little harder for mum to look after two youngsters at the same time. But it does happen in nature, but it's not as common as one on their own. But anyway, we're going to continue on down here as Archie just looks into the distance there. That is an area we're going to head to now called the Salt Lick area. And look at all those wildebeest there. There's a lot of salts on the ground. And the wildebeest all like coming down there for the vegetation and the ground. But anyway, James has got some wonderful action with Hosanna and that cheeky hyena. Look at this cheeky hyena, Corky. She's not being so cheeky at the moment. She's just sitting there resting. She sat down now, decided that she's going to have to be more patient even than she thought she'd had to. And she's probably thinking to herself, well, I might have to go back to my den to feed my baby at some stage. Because, of course, hyena cubs nurse much longer than many of the other predators, sometimes for more than a year. In fact, normally for more than a year. But that doesn't mean they don't start eating meat quite soon after they're born. And so she'll be thinking about the little one. And I think the little one is probably now about two or three weeks old, I'd say. See how her ears are moving constantly, listening out for perhaps other hyenas coming, or for the sound of something dropping out of the tree. Her nose is constantly working as well. And although you and I would sit in a position like this and be unable to smell anything other than a little bit of the rain, and perhaps, obviously, bits and pieces of the vehicle that I'm sitting in, because vehicles smell quite strong. Otherwise, you know, there's not much to smell here, but we don't have noses anything like, as sensitive as a hyena's. And a hyena's nose is about 40, 40 to 50 times more powerful than ours. And so you can imagine, if you were walking through something like a shopping centre, for example, a mall, and you had the nose of a hyena, and you weren't used to smelling like a hyena, you would be probably feeling pretty sick after about five minutes, because all of the funny smells of people's feet and their underarms, the kinds of things that you don't smell normally, would be very strong. And out here, it's not so helpful in a mall, but out here, of course, very helpful for a hyena that is trying to smell rotting meat on the wind. So if there's a carcass a long way away, probably more than two kilometers away, this hyena would be able to smell that meat and then go straight there. Hyenas are very good at that. Even leopards are very good at that. And so although they can kill for themselves, they are very, very good at smelling and scavenging. Oh, Laura Moore, when hyenas are happy, they show it uh, by singing the song, If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Except they don't clap their hands, they snap their jaws. So the hyena version of the song goes, If you're happy and you know it, snap your jaws. If you're happy and you know it, snap your jaws. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, snap your jaws. That's how our hyena shows it's happy. Um, that's not... 
a serious answer, obviously, everybody. Um, <laughs> hyenas show they are happy. Uh, well, I don't know how they show they're happy, but I guess they'd indicate contentedness, uh, which means they'd indicate a sense of satisfaction, that they weren't unhappy, that they were not threatened, that they were full of food by going to sleep, I suppose, and also by relaxing, putting their tails down. When they're unhappy, they lift their tails up, or when they're stressed, they lift their tails up, uh, and I suppose they'd just put their heads between their paws and go to sleep. But otherwise, it's very difficult to tell, of course, because mostly with a human being, you'd know if they were happy from looking at their faces. And we have very expressive faces, lots and lots of muscles in our faces. Ooh, what's going on? Oh, there we go. Dropped a little piece of meat and down the throat it goes. Very clever hyena, that, isn't she? Well done, Corky. Oh, I wonder if she's not going off to the den. Maybe she's taking a little piece off to give to her baby. We'll have to find out. We might actually decide to follow her in a little while. That'll be quite fun to see. She went running off quite fast. Now, I'm actually not too sure where that new den is, so I'm going to find out. And then perhaps we'll head along there and see if we can't show you a baby hyena. That would be very special, wouldn't it? In the meantime, the very special cat is eating in his tree. Connie, it really does depend on the animal. Sadly, yes, quite often that is the case, that if an animal parent dies out here, the baby will be doomed. In the case of a leopard, almost certainly. In the case of a hyena, almost certainly. In the case of an elephant, however, what is very interesting is that they will be adopted. So if an elephant mother dies, someone else in the herd will adopt that baby and they'll look after them. And that's one of the reasons that everybody loves elephants so much. In the case of a wild dog puppy, uh, well, as long as when there was another wild dog producing milk, they would look after the youngsters. But of course, in a wild dog pack or a wolf pack, it's normally only one female that breeds. So if the mother dies and there is no milk left, well, then the babies will be doomed and if no one else is able to produce milk. Uh, in terms, I'm trying to think of other examples. You might find in a baboon troop that from time to time a, a foreign mother might help suckle a youngster, but it would be very, very unusual. And I'm trying to think of other examples out here. Normally, I'm afraid it does mean in the mammals that the baby would die. Obviously, with human beings, we're also mammals. And, uh, well, the reason that we find it uh, difficult to accept that a youngster would die out here if its mother died is that that's not how we act. We would adopt a baby if its mother died or was unable to feed it. And in fact, that's why we find animals like elephants and their attitude to looking after youngsters so appealing. We like that because it's like us. It shows the same values that we have. I'm not sure that values is the correct word, but I suppose it probably might be. The hyena's just behind us. I'm not going to move the car at the moment. She's smelling. Right, while we wait and see what she does, let's head across to a blustery place where there could be hippos. There are hippos, good guess. Now we are sitting at Chitwa Chitwa Dam and it's the biggest dam in the whole of the Sabi Sands of this area and there aren't many dams that actually have water in them at the moment and this little sprinkle of rain is really not going to do too much but look at all those hippos, they're huddled up, I wonder if they're cold or just as cold as we are, they're definitely wetter than we are because they spend most of their day in the water. There's little ones, there's big ones, there's medium sized hippo they're all there. Now they're just relaxing for the moment. I think they're trying to keep out of the wind. Not very many animals other than the predators, the lions, the leopards, the hyenas, they really like the, uh, the wind. And that lapwing won't mind the wind too much. What's she doing? Looks like he's going to sit down. 
you're gonna get comfy maybe it has a nest there so that, that's called a blacksmith lapwing and they lay their eggs down on the ground now Janine you've asked if we've seen any woodland kingfishers no not yet we did hear some cuckoos today. I can't remember. It was was it was it Pete Mayfair? Was it red? Not red chested. It was must have been the class's cuckoo that we heard calling. I just had to remember who, what bird said what, which was quite cool. It was either someone whistling a very good tune of a class's cuckoo, or someone was playing it as a sound on their phone. Oh, I could have imagined it. I mean, it could have gone three ways there. But anyways, but um, no, no woodland kingfishers just yet. But now other kingfishers that we might see over here are pied kingfishers. What's that antelope doing on the island? Now you can see we've got our roofs on to try and keep us nice and dry, but they're not working too well. Oh my goodness, look at that bushback. <laughs> Is that Gogo 2.0? That looks like a very, very old bushback. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very very old bushbuck now when I say the word <laughs> Kirsty who's directing says that this bushbuck has been stuck on this island for a very long time now's your chance to escape the water's low anyway she looks very very old the reason why I say that is because her face is so gray and she's got those bleach patches on top of her head or maybe she's just had her hair done highlights are in the season so you never really know which which way and I can't speak to the bushbuck because I don't speak their language but she's also doesn't have very good table manners look how she's chewing it's like she's got a piece of bubble gum in her mouth but I think she's really happy because not many animals can go and eat on that island except David and I had the buffalo there they crossed the little bit of water now the buffalo don't normally eat leaves like that bush buck does but because there's not really any grass around they didn't have much of a choice so they just gobbled them down anyways sometimes oh there's an Egyptian goose that's it's a one-legged Egyptian goose well there's, there's one one-legged Egyptian goose and, and then one two-legged Egyptian goose I think it's just resting its foot at the moment and look how cold they are that one doesn't even want to stick its neck out in this weather maybe it's wearing a turtleneck <laughs> a goose neck <laughs> I think I'm very funny <laughs> let's see it's gonna call look <laughs> No, I thought it was going to make its call and they flap their wings the way it started moving its head, see? That's why they called them Egyptian geese. You know that dance move where you put your hands out to the side? Must I demonstrate, Darby? Yeah. I have to demonstrate now. What's this? I know that one. That one. <laughs> that was the Egyptian goose dance. But then they also flap their wings at the same time. Yeah, I'll be here all day, Kirsty, all day doing these dance moves. Now, the reason why they will make that, make the, the very loud sound and uh, flap their wings around and bob their necks is because they're very territorial. So what territorial means is that they want to protect their home where they live and they'll chase all the other birds away. They don't want anyone to come nearby. So by shouting out loud, they're saying, hey, keep away from us, this is our island. We got you first, basically and then that's that's all it means <laughs> anyways i really want to get a little bit closer to that bushbuck how do you feel david i think so we don't normally see bushbuck they, they're actually very shy antelope and they like to live in very very thick areas with lots of trees around them and so it's really nice to see one out in the open like that so i'm going to go a little bit closer and i have a feeling that this bushbuck is relaxed because you're going to see a, a, a lodge now called chitwa chitwa there she is and I think she goes in there to eat all the nice all the nice uh, leaves that are very green that's a very old bushbuck and you can see look how cold she is she hasn't even brushed her hair today it's all standing up it kind of looks a little bit like mine it goes frizzy with the rain but that's awesome to see so she's ruminating at the moment so but she's basically what she's doing you can sometimes see her we'll see if she once she finishes chewing we call that a cud ball so it's basically a ball of grass and leaves look watch watch her throat whoop did you see that come up how cool is that amazing now she's chewing it again so she's and then she'll swallow it oh i think that's pretty cool they have dinner twice sometimes three or four times <laughs> wonderful shame she must be absolutely freezing she's very busy today and even though she's just standing like that she's actually still using energy by by digesting her food 
but maybe she's got a nice little sheltered spot in between those trees that'll be keeping her nice and warm. I'm a little bit sad that there's no really any animals down at the water today. It's very quiet. Normally there's lots and lots of things to have a look at. David, can you get the fish eagle? Am I going to have to reposition for you? Oh, no, perfect. Look at that bird over there. That is called an African fish eagle. And it has got very wet feathers at the moment, so I don't know how much flying it'll, it'll be doing. Maybe a little bit. And what that bird likes to do is it likes to swoop over the whole dam and then stick its feet in the water and catch a fish. They're really good at catching fish, but they also eat birds, they'll scavenge on the carcasses, they'll kind of just eat anything, but experts at, uh, at fishing. And they don't even have any feathers on their legs all the way down to their feet so that they can fish properly. Otherwise, if they had feathers all the way down to their feet, they'd probably then land face first into the water if they try to put their, try put their feet down in the water. But it's looking at something. Very focused. Maybe there's another fish eagle sitting somewhere else. They're also territorial, like the Egyptian geese. Wonderful. Right, I'm going to try and creep up closer to that old lady bush back over there. In the meantime, it seems like Steve is doing a fantastic job in Kenya and he's managed to find you the biggest cats in Africa. Poor old bush buck. Shame. That is what happens out in the wild, unfortunately. We do all get old at some point. Um, but Archie and I were driving along and we had a bit of a feeling about going up this road that took us up the mountain and Look at what we found. Two beautiful lioness lying up close to some trees. It was very hot about an hour and a half ago before this rain came through. And now everything's cooled down. So they probably moved into the shade sometime in the day to try and just get away from the heat of the day. And now it is nice and cool. But she does look a little bit, a little bit full, the one on the right. Yeah, lots of wildebeest around at the moment, so lots to eat. But maybe we'll be lucky and they might get up and move. You never know. Lions like to move when the temperatures are nice and cool. They don't like to move too much when it's hot. Most of the time you'll see them sitting just like that, lying down flat. But I'm not 100% sure who these lions are just yet. I found a pride here last week, which were called the Salt Lick Pride. And um, I think it might be the same. Oregon, you think they look so light colored. I agree with you completely. Um, the lionesses that I saw the other day of the Salt Lick Pride were very light in color. And these two are a little bit paler than the others that we normally come across. And that might have something to do with the area they hang out in. I'm not really sure. Look at that. One on the left is awake and the one on the left is still sleeping. She heard the alarm clock but doesn't want to wake up. Do we all know that feeling on a Saturday when the alarm clock goes off? We go, oh no, alarm clock. <laughs> but she's listening. In the distance she can obviously see animals and it's uh, very hard for lions to not look towards the animals. They always think dinner is over there. It's all about then getting up the energy to stand up, walk towards them, and then actually practice a hunt. There we go, she's going back to sleep again. But I think there's someone else in the bushes there. She keeps looking in that direction, doesn't she? Last time I saw these lions, there were four of them with a big male. I mean, lovely to be able to find him. We haven't seen any of them since last week, Monday. But the Mara Triangle is a really big area to be driving around in. And if the lions are just off the road like where they are now and you don't happen to drive along the road we just did, well, and you just won't see them. It's just not possible. But very good. Sometimes that feeling that you get in your tummy, you have to go with it. Many, many times I've had that feeling and I've found leopards and lions. Ravinda, I'm not sure at the moment. Um, I believe there was one of the prides. I think it was a sausage tree pride. It had a white young lion. I don't know if he's still around. I don't know if he survived, but I haven't seen any yet. These two are quite pale, but they wouldn't be classified as white because they're not very, very light in color. But don't forget white is not an albino. They still have pigment. They still have coloration. It's just a very, very low amount of melanin or no melanin at all. 
which is why it's so beautiful and white but a white lion out in the wilderness they don't really do very well because they stand out like a white plastic packet in the middle of nowhere and the lion's objective is to be camouflaged and to blend in with the grass just like those little topi youngsters we saw before and uh, in this area where there's been a fire the grass is very very short and the lions don't hide very well so they'll have to hunt at night but in other areas that we'll try and get to and the grass is long it's about as tall as my knee sometimes even longer and in that grass you absolutely lose any form of animal in there okay well all the way back down to South Africa with Taylor McCurdy who's still at Chitwa watching hole We are, we are, we are. We have, we're struggling to find things though, so we're trying to look at birds. There's lots of swallows and things flying around now. Ah, look what's landed in front of us. Oh, what have, wait, wait, actually, what have you got there? Are they all just sitting on the side of the wall? I think they're just trying to keep warm. It doesn't look like they're any, maybe they're nesting? I can't see very well. Oh my, they're freezing! Shame, look at them. They're all just trying to keep out of the wind in the miserable rainy weather so they're just gonna sit there I think for most of the day oh no that's a shame that's so sad right okay all the birds have flown away in front of us well oh no hang on there's sparrows look at those interesting things on the floor well those are southern grey-headed sparrows don't you fly away you must stay there little birdies they're very pretty but I'm sure some of you well I'm sure most of you get sparrows at home of the equivalent we're just going to carry on along here. Oh, hang on. Hippos have got out of the water. I have to just turn the car like this. Look at that. Now you can see how big a hippopotamus gets. I'm going to lay down so you can all see nicely. There they are. Oh, this is interesting. Hi, hippos. Oh no, look at all the scratches on that hippo's back. That's no good. Shame, that one's obviously got into a bit of a fight now. Hippos have got very, very big sharp teeth. And when they get angry, they get really angry. And, and that's what can happen. They can get all these big cuts on them. But hippos are very, very lucky because they have the stuff that they secrete from, from their bodies. And, uh, and basically in that substance, it has got a sunblock, so it helps protect them from the sun. And it's also got an antibacterial, which means it's basically got medicine. So it will help fix all those scars and cuts really, really quickly. And as you can imagine, these hippos live in very dirty water. So they could get an infection. So they've got something to help them get better very quickly. But they're very lucky to see a hippopotamus out of the water because they normally only come out at night time or when it's nice and cool like today. But I haven't seen a hippo out of the water for quite some time. So that's a boy hippopotamus over there. And he's big, but I don't think he's fully grown just yet. I think he's still quite young. I think he's maybe hungry. They're all, animals are all very hungry at the moment because there's not a lot of grass. And hippos love to eat grass. It's their favorite thing in the whole wide world. Where are you going? He's going into that thicket. There's not much food in there either. So the hippos have to move very, very far away at the moment to try and find nice grass. Now, Zephyr, you've, you've asked if those wounds that we saw on the other hippopotamus could have maybe been from lions. I, you know, I don't think so. That The, the injuries we saw on that hippo are very, very common, um, actually, to see on hippopotamus. And I really think that it was another hippo that did that. I didn't see if it was a girl or a boy hippo. If it was a young boy, he might have... He might um, have got too close to maybe the big, big hippopotamus bull. And uh, and then he'd be very angry and then would have maybe chased him around a little bit. So I think that's what could have happened. But yes, lions, if they're big enough prides, will try and go for hippos. Listen. That's the hippos talking. They're saying hello to all of you. Very friendly hippopotamus. They're friendly from a distance. You don't want to walk up to a hippo and try and touch it. Now, James, of course, has not moved at all. He's still with the leopard and and now the hyena is around 
Oh, she's looking a little bit frustrated now. She got another small piece and then she swallowed it down. But I must say, she's looking anxious. She's looking up and she's looking around all the time. And I think it's because the wind is strong. And so it's difficult for her to smell and to hear. And I suspect also that because she's got a young cub, she's probably feeling quite stressed generally. Thinking, should I go back? Should I wait here? Wondering if the cub is safe there at the den site. Brittany, she's got a very funny name, doesn't she? Corky. Brittany, her name is Corky because what she likes to do, or what, when we gave her her name, what she used to do, was she would sit at the den and she would plug the hole that her cub was in like a cork. And so that's why she's called Corky. It's a funny name for a hyena, I suppose. But that's why, that's why she's called Corky. And it just kind of stuck. And she's just going to have to wait very patiently. Now, if you watch again, which of course you should watch again, you can see that she's relatively easy to recognize because of those distinctive cuts on her left ear. So that's pretty distinctive. It makes it quite easy for us to identify Corky. We don't have to wait until she goes to a den and put her bottom into it to cork it up. So those, that torn ear is pretty distinctive. But also, you could recognize her from the spots on her body. Now, it's very difficult to just do that straight off. But and some of our viewers are real hyena experts. And, for example, if you just showed them those spots on the left shoulder, they'd be able to tell you straight away that this is Corky. They've made a real study of the hyenas here. She's looking in very, very good condition. Now, she jumped like that because another vehicle started its engine. Normally, the hyenas don't react like that, but because she's just a bit tense, she can smell something funny on the wind, or like I say, maybe it's because she's got her babies. Maybe that's why she's just a little bit tense and a little bit jumpy. Joe, no, I don't think she is the biggest female. I think Madam is the biggest female, if I'm not mistaken. She is the is the matriarch, or certainly has been the matriarch of this clan for a long time. And we don't know exactly where she is because we haven't had a den site on Juma for quite some time. And so normally the matriarch is the biggest hyena. She'll probably be very similar size to Corky. But if, a, for example, if a very junior or low-ranking hyena is much bigger than a senior or high-ranking hyena, often that junior hyena will replace the senior hyena on the hierarchy, so she'll dominate the smaller one. Size plays a hugely important role out here in the animal kingdom, much less than it does in the human world, but I suspect it probably plays a bigger role in the human world than we uh, like to admit quite a lot of the time. I'm going to reverse backwards slightly and let's see if we can't get a better view. The leopard is still in the tree by the way, he hasn't moved at all. Sounds off. Oh, there she goes. She did find some meat. Very clever. Riti, hyenas and leopards will fight with each other if they get into a space where the leopard is unable to run away. So a leopard is very unlikely to choose to be in a fight with a hyena because a leopard needs to be very careful. Now, there's a very good reason for this. Many of our viewers will have heard me say this a hundred times, but I shall say it again because it's very important. A leopard, because it is solitary, cannot afford to get injured. So unlike a hyena or a lion or a wild dog, which lives in a group, if a leopard gets injured, it will be unable to hunt. And so it would be very difficult for the leopard to survive. Whereas if you're an injured hyena or lion or wild dog, well, while your clan or your pride might not necessarily help you eat, you can certainly go and get some scraps from what they've killed or what they've stolen. 
And in the case of a wild dog, of course, they will actively feed injured animals. Whereas a leopard can do nothing if it's injured. It, is, it must try and hunt while it is injured. Let me go back a little... No, I'm going to stay right here. She's giving us a great show this afternoon. And you know, so often on these afternoons when it's cloudy and rainy, we don't see much. But it's very nice to be sitting with Corky now. Linda, I suspect you'll find that Corky can be away from her cub for almost a full day without it having any effect on the baby. They'll be able to survive that long without milk, but I don't think much longer than that before the youngster would have to be fed and starvation would become a risk. So, I, you know, I'm hoping that she's going to take us back to the den at some stage today. That would be very special, because I love hyena cubs. And I used to go very often when we had a hyena den on Juma. I'd go almost every day, actually, to go and see what was going on there. And that's, of course, the best place to learn the hierarchy, learn who's senior, who's junior, who's coming up the ranks. And I say she's in good condition. If you look at her there, you can see the muscles on her neck, very powerful. She's got a nice fat belly. You can't see her hips, really. You can't see her ribs. So she's in good condition. Look at the muscles on her shoulders there. Very powerful animal. Now, if there are animals on the continent here who are eating more than the hyenas here at Juma, well, then they are probably the lions of the Masai Mara. Yes, well, these animals will compete quite heavily with hyena in these areas. And uh, up in the Masai Mara, we get huge groups and families of hyena because there is so much food that they need to fight against the big prides of lion. We're down in Juma. You don't really see the hyena playing too much with the lions. Often with the leopard, you'll always see them following poor little Hassan there to steal his food. And very often they do catch his food. But up here, the lion prides specialize in the big game, like the wildebeest over there. And the hyena also specialize in hunting them. They don't only steal from lions, they also will fight the lions from their own kills and they will also hunt for themselves. So very important up here. Rosalind, you want to know if hyenas are stronger than lions? They are not. I mean a female lioness gets up to about 135 pounds, so about 135 kilograms, so about 260 pounds, maybe a bit more than that, whereas the biggest hyena you will get, probably about 180 pounds, the biggest. So really what hyena do and where their strength comes is in numbers. Some of the clans up here in the Mara can be over 70 numbers. 70! So that is a really, really big number. And when they see lion, well, they can chase them off because there's just so many of them, so many mouths, like an army of hyena coming in. And when there's so many, lions will often move away. But it's not just against the lions that they're fighting. They also have enormous territory warfare with other hyena in the areas which also have a very similar size numbers there but these lions are not fighting with anybody right now they are probably drenched from the rain that came through probably feeling quite happy that it's not as warm as it was but still having a nap because lions boys and girls will sleep for at least 20 hours every day Oh, Lala Moor, you want to know if there's any caves in the Mara? Well, there's no caves that I know of. I did ask around last time as asked a question, and I haven't heard of any caves in the Mara itself. It's possible there might be some nooks and crannies in the mountains, but not any real caves. And lions aren't really known for living in caves. It's a misconception. A lot of people think caves and lions, and I suppose even in the Bible they talk about the lion den, and it's not really something that happens. Lions live out on the open landscape, and if anything lived in a den, it would be a hyena. Maybe a leopard, but they don't really live in caves themselves. We are the people who 
coined the, the cave livers, the cave dwellers, and that's how we managed to overcome these guys on the landscape. But our lions are sleeping. It looks like the little chief is up and active. Oh, he's down. There he is. Look at him. He's looking at you now. He's very happy to see you and to meet you. And he's looking at the hyena. I don't see exactly where the hyena is at the moment. Why was Linda in such a bouncy tree? What's that, Linda? Is that what you said? A bouncy tree? Um, Linda, I don't think it's a very bouncy tree. It's a pretty standard issue bounce tree, this one. Um, I don't really know how to answer that question, Linda. It's a yeah, pretty normal tree. It's branchy. It's very uh, it's full of branches. Oh, I see it. So you mean oh, the, bran the branches look unstable. Uh, well, you know, often, Linda, what they do is they just take the animal that they've killed up the first tree that is safe. And what I think happened here is that he was been feeding on the ground all day and then the hyena pitched up. And so he would have grabbed the kill and taken it up the first tree he could use. And so this is one of the ones that he could find. It's a good one. There's a better one not too far from where we're sitting. It would probably have been a better option. But this one is not too bad. But you'll find that's why he's come down to clean himself. So he's full. He's eaten enough now. And because the tree isn't particularly comfortable, there are no nice, wide, smooth branches for him to lie on, he'll come and rest on the ground and do his cleaning on the ground and that sort of thing rather than doing it up in the tree. Whereas if the tree was slightly more comfortable with smoother bark, like a marula tree, this particular tree is called a tamburti tree, but if it was a marula tree, well, then he would probably spend a bit more time in the tree resting. Look at him. Oh, he's a wonderful cat, that. Now, if you do see a pole or some canvas, it is because it has been raining today and we've had to put our roof up and that's to protect us from the rain. Hello, fella. I haven't seen him for more than three weeks, everyone. And he's quite easy to recognize. I'm not very good at recognizing our animals, but he's pretty easy to recognize. Oh, that's hopeless. All right, let me try and move the car slightly and see if we can get a better view. <laughs> All right. Taylor's got a close relative of the unfortunate antelope that is up in the tree over there. Well, normally antelope can't climb trees. Sometimes, sometimes they can. This is a really, really big one. This is called a kudu, and it's one of my, the most beautiful antelope out here. But he's hiding behind a tree. But I think if we're patient, we either see him or we'll see his friend because there's another big kudu that's actually coming just up on the termite mount just oh no no he's disappearing look at his big horns so that's what we call the things on the top of his head they're not antlers those are called horns oh they're going back down again or well, at least he came out in the open quickly so that we could have a look at him isn't that clever see how he lowers his head and tilts it up just slightly so that the kudu horns which are really really long don't get stuck on any of the branches. Ah, oh, that was awesome, but they're on the go now. Hi, Kudu. Maybe we can see them one last time. Let's see if, uh, if they're gonna run away from us. A little bit. I'm just gonna run away a little bit, so I'm just gonna quickly turn around. But um, they're gonna go out of our property now, so where we can't go. Now these actually, they're big, but they're not the big boys. You'll see some kudu that are even bigger than these guys. They don't have much muscle now. Look how careful they're being too. They don't want to just walk very quickly into that area because it could be a lion there and then they'd be in a lot of trouble. So they're just going to take their time and move on in slowly. But they're beautiful. 
And it's really nice to see them. Sometimes they're so shy, you just get a quick glimpse of them before they've completely run away. So count yourselves very, very lucky to see these amazing antelope out in the open like this and not running around. Look at little white tips on the tops of their horns and look at those spirals. So you know we saw that bush buck, Gogo, that I was telling you about on the island. This is the relative also. So we see the kudu, the inyala, and the bushbuck, and they're all in the same family. So they are cousins of one another, basically. They're in the family of antelope with spiraled horns. And you can see why. But the kudu have got the most incredible horns, and their ones twist the most. And then the inyala is the next biggest, and then the bushbuck is the small one. Right, we're going to go see what else we can find now. But if we go back to James, who's still with that pretty leopard. Yes, the little leopard is now cleaning himself a little bit away from the tree. We don't have a great view. But let's wait here and see what he does. We've got a little bit longer of our kids' drive. And so I don't think we'll go anywhere from here. We'll enjoy the sighting of Hosanna, the male leopard. <laughs> Karen, uh, I'm sure he has grown slightly since I last saw him three and a bit weeks ago, but I can't notice a difference, no. If I was to guess, I'd say he's probably put on about a kilogram or so. That would be my guess. Maybe put on a kilogram or so. It's about two pounds, maybe a pound. From now, he'll go grow pretty slowly until his maximum size, which he'll attain around about six years. And he'll grow even slower between four years and six years. So he grew pretty quickly up until this point. But if I went away for six months and then came back and saw him, yes, then I would notice quite a big difference. But three weeks, no, not so much. If he had been very tiny, say only three weeks old, and I'd come back and he was six weeks old, well, then the difference would be obvious. And if you ever want an example of that, all you need to do is watch a, a puppy or a kitten grow. And you'll notice that when they're very young, they also grow at a tremendous speed. There we go. Good. I'm glad we didn't move. I think we stayed in the right place. Pole's going to come into the picture. Sorry about that. There it is. Now he's got quite a short nose for a leopard. That's how I recognize him straight away. And there is another vehicle there. They're enjoying the sighting as well with us. And he's in very good condition. Often you'll see young leopards or older leopards even, get up and limp a little bit because they're stiff from some or other injury that they've gained. That's a rattling sticker of that bird you can see there. I think. Yep. Now he might lie down there, but often what happens now is that they'll go to the loo, which is not really much fun to watch. June leopards can actually go without drinking almost permanently. They can live in desert areas and almost never drink, and that's because they get sufficient water from their prey. But if they can drink, they will. So there's water close by. It hasn't been a hot day today. He might go and have a drink a bit later, but it's not necessary that for him to drink now. Often they do drink when it's hot and when they've eaten a lot and their stomachs are very full. I'm not going to move just yet. I think we're going to wait and see. Oh, now we all, all we've got is bush. No, here we go. Let's just see if he lies down or if he moves. No, he's lying down. All right, let's try and get one more view of him. I know we've got very little time left on the kids' show. Yeah, you might get a view of him there, Senzel. How's that? Is that all right? There we go. 
and a nice last view of Hosanna. All right, kids, thank you very much for joining us. If you want to keep watching, you just go to Safari Live on YouTube. You can catch the rest of our two-hour drive. Otherwise, we'll see you next Saturday for the Nat Geo Kids Drive. It's been wonderful having you with us. Thank you for your questions and your comments, and we'll see you again same time next week. Bye-bye.